Well, it's, you know, I think everything has shifted since September 11th, yeah. and it's made me rethink um, both passion in the positive sense of love and engagement, and also the shadow side of passion, as we've seen exhibited through terrorism in this country. So um, I will tell you, Ted, as a writer, I'm rethinking everything. Um, passion and patience in the desert, to me, is about loving the places where we live, mm -hmm. um, following the strand of our heart, why we are drawn to a place and choose to stay there. Yeah. To me, that, yeah. that requires both passion and patience. I'm rethinking what the word justice means. I'm rethinking what the word restraint means. There are moments in this civic dialogue um, with our president and with, with this country, um, among my family and our friends, gatherings, public gatherings, where I'm thinking, let us not forget the option of restraint, that it's no longer the survival of the fittest, but the survival of compassion. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about compassion, and what does that mean in as we are on the threshold um, of war? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's stretching all of us. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I find myself checking my speech um, because I think there are many ways to define patriotism. And as a writer, I think we have to ask some very tough questions. You know, who has the courage to see this wave of destruction as a wave of renewal? And, you know, we have to ask not only who did this, but why did they do it? And why has our country provoked such hatred around the world? Mm -hmm. So I think it's a time both for national solidarity, but also a time for deep social national reflection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How, how might we live differently? How mm -hmm. might we respond differently um, to the world? And to each other. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely, in our own families and communities. Mm -hmm. And it's also made me rethink, Ted, um, the discussion of wilderness you know, both in the state and in the country. That's been a very divisive mm -hmm. um, yes. discussion, as you well know. Mm -hmm. how, how are we to find our way toward conversation? And I can only speak for myself, but I was in Washington, D.C. Um, when the Pentagon was struck right across from the White House. And that, that panic of those early hours will forever be lodged in my body. Indeed. And when I came home, finally, um, five days later, and saw the Wasatch Mountains from the window of that plane, I just, I couldn't stop crying. crying. Sure. And I think in many ways, these wild lands, our national parks, wildlife refuges, uh, wilderness areas have never been more relevant, relevant, relevant or yeah. germane to yeah. our own sense of peace and solace. It's a great question, because I think wilderness is an American value. And I think that as more and more of, of our American West is, is whittled away through development, um, et cetera, it becomes more and more precious to us. And I think if we lose the last remaining open spaces in Utah, in the American West, we lose an enormous part of, our, of ourselves, who we are, how we define ourselves. I was just talking to a friend that was saying he can hardly wait to just go to Eureka you know, where it's quieter, where, where there's more semblance of peace. Mm -hmm. uh, Brooke and I, we found that our first reaction when we landed, you know, back in, in Salt Lake City, we went up to the Tetons, where it seemed like there really was a fortress that couldn't be bombed. Mm -hmm. And we found ourselves in the midst of bugling elk. Mm -hmm. And again, I just wept the sounds of sirens that had imprinted on my psyche of five days in a police state in our nation's capital suddenly was replaced by this ancient ritual of, of the autumn, the bugling elk. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think wilderness is a place of original mind. It's a place of freedom. It's a place where we remember what we are connected to, where we derive our strength, inspiration, and imagination. Well, it was interesting. Um, I went back and read a book on the the Twin Towers yeah, on yeah. the World Trade Center. And the author, it was interesting, he said, what kind of a concept 
is that any way to have 50,000 people in two narrow cubes that at some point human scale was forgotten? Mm -hmm. And then I thought it was also interesting that the architect, his statement for the Twin Towers was, was a statement of peace. And I thought, isn't that interesting that, that now in, the, in their absence, we, we could find a presence of peace? I know Murkowski, you know, Senator Murkowski, mm -hmm. the very day that we were attacked, um, put out a statement that it is no longer whether or not we will drill in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. He said, we will, it is now a matter of national security. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I hope we don't fall into this wave of um, mob thinking. You know, I think we still have to have dialogue. I think we still have to engage in democracy. And, and I think the debate of whether or not we drill in the Arctic is on the table before the American people. Well, my father thought it was a complete and utter act of madness. <laughs> um, and my sister-in-law was great. She said, we're going down tomorrow. You show me what's so beautiful there that you would be leaving <laughs> our family. And along the way, it was deadly um, in that my nieces had all written letters. And she handed me a letter each mile. You know, And one of Sarah said, Dear Terry, in case you've forgotten how much you love us. Um, so it was hard. Yeah. You know, I yeah. mean, and there, there are real sacrifices um, in terms of not being near dad yeah. and, and our families. Yeah. But I think it's something Brooke and I have been thinking about for a long time, a sense of proportion, a sense of quiet, a sense of solitude. And it was one of those moments where we saw this house, um, we fell in love. We drove home, we cleaned our house, we put a for sale sign and it sold in four hours and, and it's made an enormous difference, Ted. Um, I feel a, a, a settling of the soul. Really, really? There's not the distractions. I go days without driving, which is probably a help to all people because I'm such mm -hmm. a bad driver, but <laughs> it's a sense of priority. Um, our home is much smaller. We got rid of, we let go of almost a thousand books and donated them to the Moab Library. It's, the house is smaller, the view is larger, and our lives are quieter. The American West is changing, we know that. Yeah. The population is increasing, people are moving here. Brooke and I are moving there. Yeah. We're part of the problem, if you will. Um, but what gives me tremendous hope, Ted, is that we do, ha we are surrounded by enormous tracts of public lands, of public commons, if you will, national parks, mm -hmm, wilderness mm -hmm. study areas, yeah. um, the Colorado River. So I think it's the choices that each of us make in our life of how, how do we live a life of greater intention? How do we try and carve some sense of integrity? And, uh, and how do we choose um, to make art? And I realized the hypocrisy in my own life, I think, of writing about wild places, living in a city. My rhetoric has changed tremendously, I think. It's mm -hmm. not so easy to make these kind of bald statements about wilderness. Um, from an urban place, but now my neighbors, um, mm -hmm. you know, feel very differently than I do. I think we have a tendency to talk to people that think like we do, mm -hmm. and um, it's not that way in southern Utah, and it's, it's been very, very humbling, and uh, my learning curve is steep. <laughs> Salt Lake will forever be my home. Yeah. And the solace of Great Salt Lake is, is forever present in my life. Mm -hmm. And my mother is a constant source of love and inspiration for me, as mm -hmm. is my grandmother. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we carry our dead with us. Mm -hmm. One hopes, one grows. And I wrote Refuge in 1991 mm -hmm. um, through seven years. And, and I think with, with the book Leap, in Refuge, I ask the question, how do we find refuge and change? In Leap, I ask the question, what do I believe? Mm -hmm. And I think in Red, I ask the question, how do these wildlands matter to the soul of this country? Mm -hmm. So I think it's a progression. It's an evolution of thought. I will read um, one piece. Actually, while reading the local newspaper, the Moab Times Independent, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I came across this tidbit in the police report. Mm -hmm. An officer was dispatched on a strange lights in the city call. The officer met with the reporting person who showed the lights to the officer. The officer noted that it looked somewhat like a planet, except it was changing colors, blue, green, red, yellow, etc. The officer noted that the light 
was way out of his jurisdiction and took no further action. What is within our jurisdiction and what is not? What do we choose to act on and what do we choose to ignore? I'm thinking about it. Yeah. You know, and I think we're thinking about it now in particular in light of, of the events that are surrounding us and the uncertainty. Mm -hmm. um, I think all we can ask from one another is, is presence, engagement, and I do think we have to act in a responsive manner of citizenship. Mm -hmm. A democracy doesn't happen by accident, so I think it requires each of us to stand our ground in the places we love. This one is called Wild Mercy. The eyes of the future are looking back at us, and they are praying for us to see beyond our own time. They are kneeling with hands clasped that we might act with restraint, that we might leave room for the life that is destined to come. To protect what is wild is to protect what is gentle. Perhaps the uncertainty we fear is the pause between our own heartbeats, the silent space that says we live only by grace. Wilderness lives by this same grace. Wild mercy is in our hands. Acceptance, the courage to stand in the center of the unknown, faith. I think Southern Utah has helped carve my spirituality, mm -hmm. and I think it's um, the word erosion. You know, you live in that country, you visit that country, and you realize um, we are all under the process of erosion. And, and I think that does create, I think there's a reason that the Desert Fathers found solace in, in the desert. Mm -hmm. um, you look at what's been carved away by wind, by water, by time, and what remains. And I think it shows us we are very, very small, and I think it shows us we are very, very large, that there's, there's this humility, grace, if you will. Mm -hmm. I think I always kept a journal. I have journals. I remember a journal from 1964. Um, I was cleaning the house and I ran across it, one of those little diaries with a lock. And I opened it up and it said, decisions, decisions, decisions. We finally got to Jackson Hole. So I think I always kept a journal. It was a dialogue with myself. It's secrets mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, in a family where voices were very strong. Yeah. Um, it was a way that I could, could make some sense of my own voice. And, and I think um, my father and mother, they always read to us. Uh, literature was very important. My grandmother was constantly reading to her grandchildren. Um, books were sacred. I remember a Christmas where mom and dad gave me all the classics and it was delicious. I think I spent, you know, even at night I would just read under the covers with a flashlight. I wonder if that's true. Do you think it is? And that may be true and I certainly think the whole notion of time. People have no time. And, and I think as a result, our souls are suffering. It is a gift and it is a luxury to be able to read, to have that kind of time. Mm -hmm. And I know um, many friends with young children and teenagers, you know, it's all they can do to find time to take a bath. And a lot of people I know read in the tub um, <laughs> and yeah. read on planes and you yeah. find places yeah. to yeah. bring those stories yeah. and literature, poetry into mm -hmm. your life. And I've been interested, again, in this this place of of uh, tenderness that we find ourselves in, there have been more mention of poetry. Mm -hmm. You know, I think of that line from Auden, our dreams of safety must disappear. Um, Mary Oliver, her, her poem, Wild Geese, you do not have to be good. Mm -hmm. You know, you only have to know your place in the family of things. I think we draw on, on poetry, on literature, mm -hmm. in times of confusion. My marriage right now is wonderful. Uh, Brooke, Brooke is my bedrock, and um, we've been married 27 years, and he is my greatest blessing. Mm -hmm. And I love our marriage. It's it's unorthodox. It's vibrant. Um, it's wild. You know, I think we spend a lot of time apart. It keeps things exciting. Um, I think we've found our own rules and model for a marriage. Mm -hmm. um, I love that we talk about everything. It's 
there's nothing I love more than sitting down and having dinner with Brooke and talking about ideas. Every morning we walk down to the Colorado River and say prayers. Um, I am constantly learning from him. He's a constant surprise, and I love his mind. And I love the family he comes from, and he and J.D. are very, very close. Mm -hmm. I love Rex and Rosie. You know, again, it's, it's this sense of family, extended family and community that I think all of us feel in Utah, and I, I don't take it for granted. Um, I am, I'm not orthodox, that's obvious, but I, I have a deep love for Mormonism, and I have a deep love for my Mormon culture, and I am Mormon. I've not been excommunicated, um, but I, I take my cue from Octavio Paz when he says, if we're interested in a revolution of the spirit, an evolution of the spirit, it requires both love and criticism. And, and I think, I hope, that, and I believe that there's enough room within the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day mm -hmm, Saints mm -hmm. for members such as myself um, who do question and who do love. And yeah. again, I don't see it that way. Yeah. You know, I belong to a family that it's very humbling. Um, not so long ago, my father said, Terry, I think it's so great you have a hobby. And, you know, so I think it's, it's all relative. I think we all struggle with what we do. And writing is very, very difficult for me. And, um, and I think words always fail us. I'm always aware of what I can't say, what I don't know how to say. And I know my nieces, um, their, their strength and power as young women of their generation. And I think if, if, if there's any way that I can, can encourage them to follow their own path, Mm -hmm. and to be courageous in that path. And my grandmother gave me that courage. Um, to trust your instincts, my mother gave me that courage. And I think each of us, um, e each human being has, has a special gift, and, and I think we have an obligation to serve that.